newsletter or a new book, it's really important to know kind of what's the theme, right? Because you have kind of an, a, big, a big picture. You want to get a big picture and then you want to kind of dive deep and then go f into the fine details. And as you're going to the fine details, knowing what the big picture is, it will guide you to understand what's the heart behind this. So does anyone have any idea what is the theme of First Timothy? Grace, mercy, and peace. That's good. That's, the, you know, like in the beginning. But that's what Paul always starts with. Except he added one here. Does anyone know what it is? Which one he added? No. He always has two. And then this one he added a third. Mercy is what, is what he added or he, yes, that's what he added. It was grace and, grace and peace is always what he starts out with and ends with. He adds mercy here. And here he adds mercy because it's to a person. And as individuals, we really need God's mercy, but we'll dive into that in a little bit. So the theme, yes, there's grace and mercy and peace, but that's not the theme of, of, the, um, of the letter. An epistle, by the way, is a letter that he wrote to them. I'll just share with you in 1 Timothy, Timothy chapter 3, and let's go to verse 14. 1 Timothy 3, verse 14, it says, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. So I, I'm writing you this letter for this specific purpose. This is my theme of the, of the letter. But what I'm really hoping is I really am with you really, really soon. I want to come to you right away. And then he says, here's what it is. But if I am delayed, in case I am, I want you to know what I'm writing to you about, what the purpose of this letter is. I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself. But that's not enough because, you know, we should learn how to conduct ourselves in general. He says, but no, specifically in a place. How you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. I want you to know how you should be in church. How you should be in my house. It's not like a thing without like just common whatever. No, there's no whatever when it comes to the house of God. There's actually real criteria, real things that I expect of you when you come to the house of God. And there's a specific way that you don't just come here and just attend. You come here and you conduct yourself in a specific way in my house, in the house of God, which is the church. So I need you to know, it's, I'm talking about that we're coming to the church, the, the church of the living God. And we don't worship some dead idols or some things that, you know, are made out of shapes that can't hear us have ears but can't hear like David wrote in a psalm. They have eyes but they can't see. But we're talking to a living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So as we come to church, he wants us to have a different mindset. I'm not just going to have a check mark. And I'm not just going just to go or because somebody told me to go. There's actually specifics of how I should conduct myself so anything that has to do with church, you're going to find it here. So I hope you're excited because this epistle, this letter is going to hit every one of us at least once, if not more than once. So if it's something that relates to a topic that you're like, ah, not me, actually you need to hear it and I need to hear it because this will apply to us as we either are part of maybe giving advice to someone or as part of maybe making decisions on certain things, but we must know but I hope we know that going to church is a big deal. It's really a big deal to God because it is, it is the truth. It's the pillar of truth. It is the church of the living God. It is the house of God. And we need to have reverence. We need to know that it is really, really, really important that we don't just come here and sit like whatever, but we come here with a purpose that God has for us. Now, before we dive into this epistle, we need to kind of meet, we said that this is not written to a church, but written to an individual, a person. So it's written to an individual and how that individual should conduct themselves in church. I want you to know this applies to 100% of us in this room. Because we are all individuals and we are, you know, if we're here on a Friday night, we probably love God. And so, or at least have some interest in God. So that means we should kind of pay attention, like, how should I conduct myself in his house? Because it's his house. He's a living God. But before we do that, why don't we meet Timothy a little bit? Because I think as, as we meet this guy, who is a young guy, I wish I could say like us, but what I could really say is like you guys, because I'm not young. But young like you guys, a young guy who really loves the Lord, but as we meet him and we get to know a little bit about him, 
we're going to find out that, you know what, we can identify with this guy. I don't know about you, but, you know, who in here would, like, would love, if you can, okay? You know, obviously, it's, anything is possible by God's grace. But who would love to be, like, you know, obviously, Jesus Christ is the ultimate. But let's say we want to go just for a straight human. Jesus Christ is 100% human, 100% God, and Timothy proves that as well. But let's say, you know, who would love to be, like, Paul the Apostle? I'd love it. But I'll tell you, when I look at his life, I'm like, okay, I'm a little discouraged. I feel like really, like, I don't know. Timothy, though, excites me. He really excites me. And I want you to know that Paul says, if you want to know, Paul goes to a place and Timothy goes to a place that is equal, equivalent. And when we find out more about Timothy, we're going to find out, wow, you know what? He's kind of like... He's normal, you know. To me, Paul is not very normal. But Timothy Seal sounds normal, like a normal guy. Like, you know, I don't know, maybe you're supernatural, but a normal guy like me. And I feel like, you know what? If God can do these things in Timothy, as we get to know him a little bit, God can do amazing things, unbelievable things through you. So please be open to him. Allow him to do his thing in you. But before, let's dive a little bit into Timothy. So first, let's look at him growing up. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, so here he is truly saved and it's genuine, which dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and I'm persuaded is in you also. So we find out that as a baby, when he grew up, he grew up and we know at least who was alive in his life. Huh? Mother and grandmother. And is this a, a, a household of believers or unbelievers? Believers, right? So here we see that his mom is a believer and his grandma is a believer. And here he is also a believer, but he was not born a believer. He became a believer later on. So we find out that he grew up in a Christian household. So, Timothy's out there. If someone in your family is a believer, I want you to know God has already blessed you a lot, okay, to have this person in your life. And here the people of influence were really his, his grandmother and mother. Now let's look at how he came to the faith. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, Verse 2, to Timothy, a true son in the faith. And so here he calls him son. So many people believe that the one who actually brought him to Christ, that God used to evangelize to him, was Paul the apostle. And so here we find out he came from a Christian home, but they were preparing him. They were sowing seeds and watering seeds, but still he didn't come to know the Lord until he met Paul the apostle. And then in that, in that time, God worked and then the Holy Spirit moved, and then he gave his life to Christ. And after he gave his life to Christ, we find out there was actually something special about Timothy. Now we find this in Acts chapter 16. So we're going to be jumping around a little bit, but this is just our first time, and then after that we'll go verse by verse. Acts 16, verse 1. Then he came to Derby and Lystra. This is Paul. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed. And we know that she's a believer from what? 2 Timothy 1.5, right? And, um, but his father was Greek. So here we find out some other more information. So what culture, what background is his mother? Jewish. How about his dad? Greek. So we find out that, you know, his growing up, when it comes to faith, it's not the most ideal. You have a believing wife married to an unbelieving husband, and then you have a child born. You know, despite, what is this telling us? It's telling us that Timothy had bad circumstances. But these circumstances did not get in the way of God coming to do an amazing thing in the life of Timothy. 
You might have a believing mom, a believing grandma, but maybe your dad is not. Maybe your dad is, doesn't even care about God, doesn't even love God. You know what? God still can do amazing things in your life where he can make you the equivalent of Paul the Apostle if you just commit yourself to God and take the walk with God very seriously. So here we see that dad did not discourage Timothy that his home was broken spiritually. And so here we see that his father is, is, a, a, is a Greek, which is a Gentile, unbeliever. And then his mother is not just a Jew, but she's a Jew who believed. She's a believer, as we also find out in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. And we find out that, that Timothy was so serious. He was really young when he gave his life to Christ. But he was extremely serious in his walk with God that the brethren, they asked believers, hey, what do you guys think? So he had, he had a, a reputation. What do you guys think of Timothy? And they're like, no, no, this guy we are, is really amazing. And they spoke really well of him. They said, this guy really loves the Lord. He's really serious about God. Yes, he's young. But he doesn't act young. He acts as a mature believer. You know, Jesus Christ, I was reading, I'm reading in Luke right now. And at age 12, he went to the temple. And in the temple, he goes... And he stays, his father and mother leave, thinking that he's with the crowd, with the, with the family. And then after a while, they're like, looking, 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 where is he, where is he, where is he? And they can't find him. They come back, and then they find him in the temple. And the crazy thing in there is it says that he was asking questions. But then, when you read it, like, slower, it says he was asking and answering, and they were astonished at his answers. So he's talking to priests, scribes, and all these high people. A 12-year-old boy, and then it turned out that they're the ones sitting at his feet, learning from him. Timothy was that kind of guy. He took his walk with God so seriously that the information that was ingrained in him, which we'll get to, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but we're going to find out how his mom and his, his grandma planted the word of God to him. Well, I'll just tell you real quickly. They say that uh, the, when they taught him the ABCs, but, you know, in, uh, in Hebrew, when they taught him the ABCs, they used every letter. You know how we say, you know, you teach kids right nowadays, what do you say? A is for? Apple. B is for? Banana. Yeah. But that's not, they, that's not how they did that. And so they, they would say A is for, and then they would use something from the Word of God. What is it? Abraham. Good. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> and they would use every, but they didn't, it's not ABCs in Hebrew, just by the way, just to be clear, you know. But they use that to the word of God, because what do we do? We're so ingrained, right? We've all been trained. Even I didn't grow up here, right? And I learned the ABCs in Egypt, you know. They're like, it is for Ahmed, <laughs> you know. <it's, laughs> that's how they taught us over there. Everything is very Muslim-based. But even not growing up here, I know that A is for what? Apple. When I call somebody on the phone, you want to give them some, you know, numbers or your, you know. A is for Apple. We're so trained, you know, alpha, you know, we say all this weird stuff. We're so ingrained in us. So they ingrained the word of God in him that he knew the word of God growing up. And they're teaching him the ABCs. But they're really teaching him the word of God. Everything, apply it to the word of God. Everything, apply it to the, to what, you know, I love uh, our little daughter, actually, her teacher right now. She... Uh, told us and told her that I want you guys that whenever you relate anything, try to relate to the Word of God. That's exactly what Eunice and, uh, uh, and Lois did with Timothy. And it made him such a powerful kid. When he gave his life to Christ, the knowledge, the information was already there. It was just there for the Holy Spirit to take to the next level. And so here he comes, and then he uh, was spoken well of by all the believers, the brethren, the true sincere believers, they said, this kid is different. He's not a little kid. He functions as a mature believer in Christ. He is not just worthy that we would, would want him to be part of the ministry. He's, he is worthy to be on your trips, Paul. You could take him with you. This guy is unbelievable. And so what, what happens is the next verse, Paul wanted to have him. Go on with him. He's like, I I'm not leaving without this guy. This guy's unbelievable. This guy, he saw the potential in him. He says, you know, I want this guy with me. And he took him. 
and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. So here we see that Timothy grew up in a Christian home, but then he gave his life to Christ when he met Paul, but there was all, all this knowledge. And actually, if you read a little bit in detail, he probably gave his life around Acts 14, and there was a time frame where Paul left him because he was not ready. He was not mature enough, didn't know enough, wasn't in tune enough with God, knowing enough of, with God for him to be used. And then he comes back. He's like, what happened to this guy? This guy blossomed. And he says, I want this guy. And then he started asking people, is it just me or is this how he is? And he took the people that lived with him day in and day out. And they're like, no, this is who he is. And he says, I'm going to take this guy with me. So something is very special about him. First Timothy chapter 1. Verse 18. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. We find out that there's something really special about him. His gift in serving God is supernatural, really special. And before he even received it, there was prophecy about it that is going to happen, that he's going to have this specific special gift, which has to do with, with the ministry of the word. Now, in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 14... It says that, do not neglect the gift that is in you. Again, that was, there was already prophecy about it. That is in you, which was given to you by prophecy, by the laying on of the hands of the eldership. And so here we see, listen, he keeps encouraging him. He says, listen, you have this gift by God that was given to you by prophecy. You need to, you need to go and serve God with it. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 6, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which was in you, through the laying on of my hands. He says, listen, this gift was given to you by the laying on of my hands. So here we see that Timothy is also chosen. Chosen by God for a specific ministry in a specific way for him to be used. But we also go into his character. If we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 17. For this reason, I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord. So here we find that he is really dear to Paul, but he's also very faithful. Faithful in the Lord. He, when it comes to God's stuff, he is really serious about it. When it comes to God's things, he does it from all his heart, and he's extremely faithful. Who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church? The other thing is he's a very faithful guy when it comes to his walk with God. When it comes to how he conducts himself and how he lives in his life, he's extremely faithful. If you open up Philippians chapter 2. Verse 20, for I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. Paul looked at all the people with him, and he had some pretty awesome people working with him. But he says, not one of them is like-minded, thinks like I think, and has the same heart that I do. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. People these faithful people that I work with, when they prioritize things, it always comes about what's for me first, and then, okay, when I have time, I'll do this for God. Not Timothy, though. He doesn't seek his own first. He seeks Christ first, and then whatever comes after that. It's always about Christ. But you know his proven character. His character is real. His character is sincere. His character is proven because you've seen it in his life day in and day out. He lives, and it, he, what he lives is Christ. For to me, to live is Christ. That as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. His life is nothing about, the God, but, about anything else but the gospel, about the word of God. And that's what he lives. That's what he breathes. And that's what moves him. And that's what keeps him going. So we see that he's very faithful. However we find that he also gets discouraged. This is what encourages me about him. Because if you look at Paul, it's kind of hard to pinpoint the point where he was discouraged. But Timothy gets discouraged. And that makes me excited because this discouraged young kid can be so powerful when he commits himself to God. When he is discouraged, 
God comes through for him and helps lift him up and brings him up. In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, it says, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. So here we find that Timothy was discouraged. He says, you know, I don't want to go to Ephesus. Why well, you have to choose the hardest church to send me to it to go? There's some beasts there in Ephesus. I, I'm not going to be able to handle it. It's really difficult. And so he says, I urged you, and I, I command you, I charge you, that you go teach the word of God. And so here we find that this discouraged guy, God doesn't say, okay, you're discouraged. Let's just put you on a different mission. No, God says, no, you're actually going to go on that mission, and I'm encouraging you, and I'm charging you, and I want you to go ahead and do it. And he did it. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, so this is the next epistle, the second letter he writes him, we find out that he still got, after he got encouraged and he went through and he did the right thing, he got discouraged again. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear. And there's some fear that started to go inside. He started to be a little afraid. He started to be shaken. And his faith started to be a, a, a little bit uh, uh, wobbly. And he says, but no, that's not the God we follow, and that's not the spirit that we have, but, what, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I want to encourage you again. God still wants to use you even though you get discouraged, even though you fall, even though you feel like a failure. God says, hey, I'm here by your side, and I'm taking you very seriously, and I'm here to take you to that next level. I've used you in 1 Timothy, and yes, I encouraged you. You got discouraged. I'm still going to encourage you again, and I want to use you again, and he did in 2 Timothy, and he used this kid who got discouraged and then discouraged again. God wants to encourage us to live for him. But we find out also that he's not the most ideal health as well. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23. No longer drink only water. But use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. We find out that Timothy had quite a bit of serious stuff at a young age. Young kid, young man, young teen, maybe teenager. And he has issues with his stomach for your stomach's sake. I don't know if you've had stomach problems, but it is not easy. You know, if you, have, if you have to have, like, issues anywhere, anywhere but the digestive system, man, it's hard. Okay? If you imagine, like, you get, like, I don't know if you've ever had, like, stomach flu or, like, you get those cramps, you know, abdominal cramps. It is not pleasant. And sometimes, you know, you can have a cramp for a minute. It feels like eternity. And it could drop you and make you just, you know, you can't breathe. I don't know how difficult it is. He had stomach problems. On top of having stomach problems, he had frequent infirmities. He gets sick and then sick and then sick and sick in and out of the hospital. The kid was just a mess from a health standpoint. And many of us, you know, if we get a little sick, it's like, okay, the world needs to know. I'm sick. I'm not going to work. I'm not going to school. Y'all better ask about me. And if you don't ask about me and bring me something, I'm not talking to you forever. And definitely, I'm not serving. Because I'm sick, man. But you know, it's so sad. You know, what Paul said was true, right? All seek their own, not the things of Christ. Despite his many infirmities, despite his stomach problems. He says what? All seek their own, not the things of Christ. Who was the only person that he found like-minded who puts Christ first no matter what? Who was it? Do you guys remember from Philippians 2? Huh? No, he did find someone. Timothy. He was talking about Timothy. All, all seek their own except this guy. No one but this guy. No one is like-minded except this guy. So there's Paul and this guy. Exactly the same. All seek their own Except Timothy. And he's the only guy with all these illnesses 
And he's sick, and he's the guy who gets discouraged, and he's like, oh, low self-esteem, like, oh, really, can God use me? Is really, is this true? And all this stuff gets discouraged, like, whoa, this is a big deal. This is a big job. I can't do it. And all these things, and God says, yes, yes, yes. Because you put me first. You're sick, you still serve me first. You have problems, you still serve me first. People stand in the way, there's walls, there's mountains. You still put me first. And that's this guy who has many infirmities, always sick, and has stomach problems, but still says, I want to serve God. And I want to put God first. And I will not let anything, I will not let my comfort or lack of it get in the way of me serving my God, me living for my God, and me taking the walk with my God extremely seriously. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, we find out something else about him. Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. On top of all of this, we find out that in the church, people don't respect him. People don't want to take him seriously. And people put him down. Can you believe that? Okay, let's be real, guys. Okay, let's pretend you, me, or Timothy. No one respects you. You got many infirmities. On top of the infirmities, there's another one that's stomach problems. And you get discouraged. How many of us would actually forget serving God? How many of us would even attend church? <laughs> So I want to encourage you, because this epistle is about how should we conduct ourselves in God's house. If you get discouraged, God has a message for you. If you feel people don't respect you, God has a message for you on how he wants you to conduct yourself. If you love the Lord, God has a message for you. If you have physical problems, issues, stuff, God has a message for you. Come to him. Come to him and tell him, Lord, I'm going to put all my baggage, take it. You're the one that said you can give us rest. Right, Matthew 11? He says, come to me, all you who are weary and you are heavy laden, carrying a lot of burdens. Whatever your baggage is, whatever your stuff is, whatever your problems are, come to me and I will, not might, I will give you rest. I'm going to give you rest. I'm going to help you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that load off. You don't have to carry it. Just come and just throw it on me. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. But in order for you to receive this rest, you have to put a yoke. You're like, wait a minute. Aren't you putting a burden? No, a yoke is not a burden. You guys know what a yoke is, right? What's a yoke? Can't hear. Help me out. Someone shout loud. Huh? Work? Yoke? Work? Mm. Not buying it, huh? Animals bond. You're getting close. You're getting warmer. Exactly. Okay. Thankfully, finally, no one said eggs. Okay. It has nothing to do with eggs. All right. So that is yoke too, by the way. But so you have, you put, when two animals go and you have them, you worked in the field and you get more power when you put two animals together. So the way to get these animals, I mean, can you imagine like you have this animal here and this animal there and then you're like, okay, let's go take care of this field and you have nothing to tie them together. Guess what? That one's going to go over here. That one's going to go over there. Your field is going to be messed up. You need what? You need them to walk in step, to guide them. They have to go in the same way. So what do you do? You put a yoke. What is a yoke? This wooden or metal thing. That you put, it has a, a thing that goes like that and a thing that goes like that. And you put their necks in it. So now they're stuck together. But the Bible actually has quite a bit of, of um, uh, in the Old Testament, it says, listen, when you put a yoke, there's a particular thing that you have to do with a yoke. 
you can't put two different animals, a yoke on two different animals. So, for example, in the specific example the Bible gives in the Old Testament, it says you can't put an, an ox and a donkey together. Why not? He says, because it's not fair. One is taller, one is shorter. So, can you imagine, look, someone pull on your neck like that? It doesn't feel good. One is faster and one is slower. So it's, you're pulling this way and that way. Like, wow, my neck is done at the end of the, not even at the end of the shift. It's more like 30 minutes into it. I can't do this anymore. He says, listen, you got to be equally yoked. Put two animals of the same nature together and you do that. That's why when we apply this to marriage, it says, well, listen, don't do the Timothy thing. Yeah, God's grace is above that. But you should what, be equally yoked, believer with believer. And I would take it another, another step is believer with a believer who also are in the same spiritual mindset. Okay? So say there's a believer that doesn't want to have anything to do with serving God. And the other believer only wants to serve God. That's not equally yoked, even though they're equally yoked by being believers. Okay? Not a healthy marriage. It's going to be problems. But so here, equally yoked. And here he says, Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. If you want your problems to be gone, you want me to give you rest, you got to what? Have my nature. Take my yoke upon you. Let walk in step with me. Let me guide you. Let me take you. But you got to take my nature. You got to be born again first. And then you got to submit and walk with me and then watch life be so easy. Let it. Let it be. Let whatever come your way come. But as long as you're walking with me, you are taking my yoke, not yours, my yoke upon you. You're willingly accepting that life of discipleship, and then you watch what, you, what will happen. You get discouraged, it's okay, I'll pull you up. People disrespect you, that's all right. I will give you favor, and I will give you grace. I will help you. I will encourage you on your path. You get sick, I'll take care of you. And that's the journey that Timothy takes here. So we'll just dive maybe into one verse, maybe the second, and then we'll continue next week. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. You have to at least finish one verse. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And I love this. Here, remember, guys, he's writing to Timothy. He says, listen, this is me. It's real. It's Paul. And I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. Apostle, just to, to define it, it's a messenger with a specific message given to them by God. He says, listen, I am not here with my own message. I'm not here appointing myself. I'm not here teaching you what I feel is next on the curriculum. But I'm here to tell you the message of God that he has put upon my heart. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God. And also, I want you to know that I did not appoint myself. There's many self-appointed preachers, teachers, pastors, leaders, worship, whatever. All kind of things in the church, self-appointed. He says, no, 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 no. You do it by your own efforts, it's going to fail. It won't go any further. He says, listen, I am, a, a, I am appointed by the commandment of God, our Savior. The word commandment here means it's a royal commission. This is something really special, really precious. It, is not, it was never in my idea, in my thought to think, hmm, Paul, I think you're going to be a pastor, a missionary, an evangelist, a teacher. No. I never thought to myself, huh, I'd really like to make money through ministry. It never crossed his mind, never wanted it, never wanted to have anything to do with it. But God says, listen, this is my calling for you. And he says, if that's your calling, amen, I will do it. And so he took on that calling from God. And he says, this was a royal commission by God, by the commandment of God, our Savior. And then he talked about God and he's had to pause. He says, you know, God saved me. How did God save us? Usually when you see the word Savior, it talks about what? Jesus Christ. But here you're talking about God the Father. And here the Father saved us. How did he save us? He saved us because salvation is in his heart. 
And then he made the method of salvation, which is through the death of Jesus Christ, to pay the price for our sins. And by that, he's able to save us. And the Lord Jesus Christ. I love it that he brings here God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, neck and neck, right by each other. What he's claiming here is the deity of Jesus Christ. That Jesus is equal with the Father, that he is God. And then here he says, the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. And that's the most beautiful word that one can hear when they feel discouraged. When they feel that what they're up against is so big, way bigger than they are. To hear that the one who is right by them is Jesus Christ, who is our hope. You feel like, you know what, I can push on. I can be encouraged. I'm not alone. That he is with me and he's going to walk by me, by my side, the Lord Jesus Christ our hope and our hope here is talking about that he is because of him that we are saved and because of him we have that hope of eternity we get to go to eternal life to have to live in heaven with him forever and ever and ever you know if you're going through some tough times be encouraged you know it's temporary the trial there's no trial that has never ended it's temporary but then afterward comes eternity is waiting for you believers it's waiting for us that we might meet the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that we come, I'm going to end here, and we'll talk about verse 2 next, next week. But um, I pray that we say, Lord, I want to know what is your calling for me. What is that specific calling you have for me? And sometimes that's a, a, a certain calling at a certain place for a certain time. It could be for just a season. And then it goes to a different thing. Sometimes it's multiple callings. Sometimes it's multiple things. Sometimes it's whatever it is. Just tell them, Lord, I'm not here to tell you what it is that you want me to do. But I want to ask you. And I want to just be a soldier who comes and reports to, for duty. Because, Lord, if you are the one who calls me, if you are the one who tells me to do something, you will, not, you will guarantee that I will be able to go through it. You're going to go walk and with me through that journey. Lord, when those disciples, when you told them, let's go cross with that boat to the other side, and you went to sleep, there was no way that you were not going to get to the other side, even though the waves and the winds was crazy, and it looked like they were gonna be, the boat was going to be wrecked and they were going to drown. There's no way because you are the one who made that commandment to cross over to the other side. And so, Lord, I want to not go through life with my own strength, in my own abilities, in my own ways. I want you to be the one who calls me to your specific calling in my life so that I may be empowered by you, trusting you, having faith in you to do that which you've called me to. I really pray that we would just say, Lord, I want to know. I want to know you, and I want to know what it is that you want from me. And I want to know specifically what it is. There's general things that's God's will for us that applies to every believer. But there's specific things that are for each one of us. And that requires sitting, spending time with Him, being desperate before Him, and, and seeking Him from all our heart as He starts to unravel that and reveal that little by little to us in our lives. Let's spend a few minutes in prayer and an open time for anyone who wants to pray out loud. Amen.
Amen. Still my heart, let your voice be all I hear now. 